It is my pleasure to welcome you to the fourth commencement lecture of the Jindal School of Journalism and Communications. We have Rinal Pandey here, who I will introduce in more detail later, but really she needs no introduction. It's an absolute pleasure to have her with us today. But uh, before we get to her and to the lecture itself, I'd like to turn it over to our Dean, Professor Tom Goldstein, for some welcome remarks. Thank you, Kajori. Uh, it's my pleasure as well to welcome you to JSJC's fourth commencement. We're beginning our fourth year. I, like you, look forward to hearing from our vice chancellor and our highly accomplished guest speaker, Rinal Pandey. Like you, I long for and wait impatiently for the day our lives return to normal. This start of the school year feels unfamiliar in so many ways. That makes the comforting ritual of a commencement, headlined by a first-rate speaker, so important. And we are so lucky today to have Marinal Pandey as our speaker. Uh, we're on a tight schedule, so let me leave the virtual stage and turn the program back to my colleague, Kajori Sen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, and with that, we officially welcome the batch of 2020 to uh, the Jindal School of Journalism and, of course, to uh, Jindal Global University and hope to have them there in person. Uh, let me turn it over to our registrar, Professor uh, Dabiru Sridhar Patnayak, for a few words. Thank you so much, uh, Kajori, and uh, thank you so much, Tom, and I welcome everyone on behalf of the university and in particular, our uh, distinguished uh, speaker this morning, Dr. Brunal Pandey, and also all the students who joined us this year, uh, the program offered by the Jindal School of Journalism and Communications. So congratulations to each one of you and it's a well-deserving recognition because you not only joined uh, one of the foremost uh, uh, journalism and media schools in the country, uh, but also, you know, at the JGU, which is uh, uh, doing very well in terms of uh, its contribution to higher education and uh, training of young minds. So we are going to have uh, a very engaging and an enriching time at the university, uh, because uh, even if you're part of the JSGC, uh, you will have an education which is, uh, in a way, multidisciplinary in nature. And as a university focused on uh, this kind of a pedagogical approach, you can draw multiple insights from other disciplines offered uh, by other schools of the university. And this kind of a pedagogical approach and investment would be uh, indeed uh, very important when you embark upon your careers uh, in the field of media and communications later on, uh, because what is more important in the current day world, which normally uh, many of us refer to quote unquote, as a post-truth world. You need to develop the uh, skills and attributes necessary uh, to uh, look at uh, information in a very objective manner. And also at the same time uh, with uh, components of neutrality and impartiality. But to do all these things, you need to understand the idea and philosophy of journalism and also develop the appropriate writing skills and such learning and qualities are indeed very important if you intend to do well in your lives and careers. And certainly we all believe and acknowledge the fact that you wanted to do well. So you're at the right place and at the right time. And we are also indeed very fortunate that Dr. Pranal Pandey is going to address all of us this morning. And even uh, the topic that uh, she chose to speak on journalism then and now, I believe is going to capture uh, some of the ideas uh, in relation to uh, the continuum of, uh, you know, the truth and the post-truth. And at the same time, uh, I would also like to make a very important mention uh, as you transition from your schools to the university, uh, being a university student is a great responsibility. So uh, it's indeed very important uh, that you uh, uh, take up responsibility uh, towards your learning, towards the community and uh, respect for the uh, spaces and the diversity that you're part of and also uh, for all the university regulations. But at the same time, believe me, uh, JGU is uh, indeed 
an egalitarian space and uh, you will have a lot of scope uh, to usher in with ideas and even to develop your skills uh, in terms of uh, expressing your thoughts and ideas and becoming uh, eloquent uh, henceforth. Uh, so I suggest you to focus on uh, taking all the benefits that the university can offer in terms of the courses inside the classroom and in terms of all the other co-curricular academic and extracurricular activities that can enable you to develop your critical thinking and leadership skills. And before I conclude, I would like to congratulate each one of you once again. And also I would like to thank all the uh, faculty members uh, led by the Dean, uh, Professor Tom Goldstein and all the relevant offices of the university for bringing this program together. I wish you all a very successful start. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Patnayak. And uh, now it's time to go over to our Vice Chancellor, Professor C. Rajkumar, who's been uh, a part of commencement processes for a decade now, but uh, this has to be new even for you, Raj. Thank you very much, uh, Kajori. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, extend a warm welcome to our distinguished commencement speaker, Dr. Mrinal Pandey. Uh, Dr. Pandey has been an inspiring figure in the larger area of journalism, as well as being a very distinguished public intellectual contributing to some of the most important uh, causes uh, that uh, we have seen. Um, and also, I think one of the remarkable things about Dr. Pandey is our uh, commitment and our steadfast commitment uh, and dedication to the pursuit of truth. And uh, she has uh, spent her lifetime speaking truth to power. And we are very delighted that she is here to inspire uh, the new students of the Jindal School of Journalism and Communication. I also want to take this opportunity to uh, thank uh, uh, Professor Tom Goldstein. Uh, Tom was, as usual, very modest about his remarks. But for all the students who have joined the Jindal School of Journalism and Communication, I would like you to know that uh, India and the OP Jindal Global University is uh, fortunate in many ways to have the presence of an outstanding uh, journalism educator uh, in Professor Tom Goldstein to be the founding dean of Jindal School of Jour Journalism and Communication. Uh, dean Goldstein has spent his entire life in the pursuit of journalism and journalism education. He has had a very distinguished uh, you know, uh, educational uh, you know, journey, uh, having obtained degrees uh, from different institutions, including from Columbia and Cambridge, but also uh, spent uh, his career uh, uh, working in New York Times and Wall Street Journal in the early phase of his career. And then of course, uh, he became the Dean of the journalism school uh, uh, called the Columbia School of Journalism uh, at Columbia University, New York. And later was also the Dean of the University of California, Berkeley School of Journalism uh, in Berkeley. Uh, he was also a member of what many of us in the field of journalism will know, uh, the Pulitzer Prize. He was a member of the Pulitzer Prize board. It is like the Nobel Prize in the field of journalism. So such has been the distinguished contributions and career trajectory of uh, Professor Tom Goldstein, who moved to India and Sonipat several years ago to uh, become the first dean of Jindal School of Journalism and Communication. I also want to recognize the presence of Professor Kajori Sain, a distinguished media person, and now in academia, uh, Professor Kishalai Bhattacharya, who's also one of our faculty members, and many others in the Jindal School of Journalism and Communication who have come to the school with a vast uh, and distinguished experience in the field of print, broadcast, and other forms of media, and also strong academic uh, you know, engagement. Uh, what I intend to do, uh, and before I do anything, I want to first say congratulations to each one of you, the students who have joined the BA in Journalism program at the Jindal School of Journalism and Communication. I cannot imagine what an extraordinary journey it has been for you. Uh, you have completed your 12th standard examination successfully. And uh, right when you were hoping to have a vacation and take a break, the world saw the global pandemic. You did not have a break. You couldn't have spent time with your family members or your friends. You couldn't travel at all. You were simply confined to your home. And now here you are, you are entering into university. Most of you have not even 
visit at the campus. And you are starting the first academic year, the most special day of your life in some ways without even visiting that institution. So I'm going to do the second best. I'm going to show you the campus, how it looks like. This is the campus that's waiting for you. Those are the student housing. And you can see the sprawling campus. It's a beautiful 100-acre campus, which is waiting for you. As of now, the campus has some 30 peacocks and hundreds of exotic birds, all of which are waiting for you. So I look forward to seeing you on campus uh, sooner than later. But I want you to know that it's a very special moment. And uh, uh, you are obviously experiencing this moment without actually being physically here. Let me also say that this is also a moment for uh, you to thank your parents, your family members, your friends who have believed in you, who have helped you in this journey, who have helped you to reach where you are and express your deep sense of gratitude because you couldn't have done what you ended up doing without all of them contributing to it in so many different ways. Let me take a moment to reflect a bit about this particular situation that you are in. Well, there is no doubt about the fact that this is an extraordinarily unprecedented situation. But it is also equally true that you have already demonstrated resilience. You have already shown the courage of conviction that this pandemic is not going to undermine your own ability to fulfill your goals and aspirations. You have already demonstrated that you will be resilient to pursue your education just as the institution that you are part of has also done that. OP Jindal Grober University began its first academic session in the year 2009 as a part of a philanthropic initiative of our founding chancellor and benefactor, Mr. Jindal. The vision then and continues to be the case that we want to build a world-class university in India, a multidisciplinary research-oriented university with strong focus on liberal arts, humanities, and social sciences, including a few professional schools, not necessarily to be invested in ideas of STEM and medicine, as we believe there are many other institutions which are doing that. Our commitment to build a world-class school of journalism was also part of our ability to contribute to the strengthening of Indian democracy, but also democracies around the world. Equally important was our vision to contribute to the strengthening of democratic institutions, the idea of pluralism, aspects that were responsible for the creation of the Indian Republic, but also for shaping the future of freedom and liberty around the world. In fact, the role of journalism and journalists, and of course, media as an institution, is so central to the idea of democracy. No democracy in the world can function effectively without the contribution of an independent media. Journalists who are doing their work, contributing to that advancement and strengthening of democracy. Imagine that we are today facing the global pandemic. If only we didn't have those journalists. I am deeply inspired by their contribution when all of us are actually confined to our homes. And even if you were to go out, it's mostly to get our own personal things done. Journalists are working in the field, getting information, checking facts, authenticating it, and actually bringing it to our own homes, either in the form of television or in the form of print. Their service is truly remarkable. Their service is no less than the service of doctors. They are truly the corona warriors in the sense that they are contributing to the availability of information, authentic, fact-checked information that is going to help us understand what's happening in the country, what's happening around the world. Of course, there are journalists who don't do that well, like many others, and that is exactly why it's important for good institutions that are advancing the cause of journalism education to be able to create curriculum, coursework, program, faculty, research, as well as experiential learning with a view to ensuring that we have journalists 
like Dr. Mrinal Pandey, journalists who are able to actually speak truth to power, but also act responsibly. Journalists who can actually help strengthen our democratic institutions. Journalists who are going to be functioning in a transparent manner. Journalists who are also going to be accountable, accountable to the people, not just accountable to their employers. So that type of journalism, which I believe is central to the future of democracy, is going to take a lot of effort. It requires people, not only with knowledge and skills, but also a deep commitment towards ethics, integrity, and honesty, and rectitude. So how do you create that type of people? How do you build a cadre of people who are able to contribute to that? So the first and foremost task in that is to build a school of journalism which can dedicate its own agenda and mission to create that type of journalists. Of course, we are mindful of the fact that uh, maybe a few decades ago, uh, the journalists of that generation, including Dr. Pandey, did not go to a journalism school to study journalism. They would have mostly ended up you know, pursuing broader liberal arts and humanities education, and then somewhere in their own you know, life and career trajectory, they decided to become a journalist and ended up becoming outstanding journalists. But that was a particular point of time in history. And even today, many people do that as well. And that is also a possibility. But one of the things that is unique about the Jindal School of Journalism and Communication is the fact that it has combined the role and importance of journalists who are also faculty members but equally important for them to ground themselves in the study of theory and practice. To be able to be interdisciplinary and the study of journalism is pursued along with the broader study of humanities and social sciences. To be able to ground yourself in disciplinary diversity, yet being committed to understanding the nuances of some disciplines. In fact, the possibility for a student of Jindal School of Journalism and Communication at Jindal means that he or she is in a position to study journalism within JSJC as a degree program, but to be able to take courses cross-listed across the nine different schools of JGU, including at the Jindal Global Law School, Jindal Global Business School, Jindal School of International Affairs, Jindal School of Government and Public Policy, Jindal School of Liberal Arts and Humanities, Jindal School of Banking and Finance, and Jindal School of Art and Architecture as well. The cross-registration of courses and the opportunity to engage and interact with students from different disciplines is part and is a hallmark of undergrad education in particular. I want to end my own remarks today by telling you 10 things that you need to be conscious of, not only as a journalist, but as somebody who might end up pursuing other careers. In fact, the journalism curriculum that we have created for you not only will enable you to become a journalist if you desire so, it will also empower you to pursue a range of career opportunities in the field of law or business or accounting or trade or finance or public policy or international relations. In many ways, it lays the foundation for a solid and a sound undergrad education. The 10 things are as follows. And if you want to note it, you may note it as well. First, these are 10 Ps to make it easy to remember. First is patience. Develop a deep sense of patience. Both as a journalist and as a student, be patient. Because today, more than ever, this is one of the most important value that we will have to cultivate. While you are pursuing online education in your own home setting, you might have a power cut. You might have internet flexibility or inflexibility, whatever. You might face challenges, even in the pursuit of your own goals. You might find difficulties in doing many things. Don't lose patience. Because if you're gonna be patient, you will find results and you will also be able to demonstrate that. Second, purpose. Develop a deep sense of purpose in your life. This is a continuous journey, but in this journey, 
develop a sense of purpose because developing a sense of purpose will help you achieve all your goals and aspirations. Start thinking about what would you really like to do in life. Some of the more fundamental questions, you may not find those answers now and maybe for the next several years, but keep seeking your purpose and mission in life. Once you identify the purpose, make that as your calling. And then you will never have to work a day in your life because whatever you are doing will become your calling in life. Third is passion. Nothing in life is possible without having a deep sense of passion. Be passionate about what you want to do. It doesn't matter what you're doing. It could be the most trivial and for some other people, most boring. But if you have the passion to pursue it, do it with that passion and you will achieve not only excellence, but you will actually find purpose in that pursuit. Four is perseverance. You know, one of the things that we find uh, among a lot of people who have achieved success in any field is they have never said no to it. Despite numerous challenges that they have faced, insurmountable challenges at times, they have succeeded with perseverance. Even causes that were impossible. Mahatma Gandhi was a good example. His own vision and aspiration to seek freedom was a cause that was achieved through perseverance. He was, of course, passionate and he found purpose and he was patient as well. So patience, purpose, passion and perseverance are critical. Fifth is perfection. You know, one of the things that we notice among a lot of people today is that there is a lot of sloppiness. Sloppiness, of course, is not a unique attribute of journalists. It is an attribute for many people. People are simply not, you know, their ability to focus on seeking perfection has unfortunately diminished. So as young people entering into university education with an aspiration to pursue journalism, develop a sense of perfection develop a sense of meticulousness because perfection and meticulousness are going to keep you in good stead in the future. At a time when mediocrity is institutionalized across all our institutions, including in media, your own commitment to perfection will put you in a good stead for achieving your goals and aspirations. Sixth P is preparation. You know, the most successful people are not the ones who are the most brilliant or who are having some native attributes of intelligence. Not really those who have prepared themselves better. The most accomplished and outstanding individuals, including journalists, they prepare well. You cannot become a great journalist. You cannot become a great lawyer. You cannot become a great scientist or whatever without preparing well. So, Preparation becomes the sixth P. Seventh P is to be punctual. Notorious problem that we have today when people simply don't have the respect for the other and do not respect the time for the other. These are values that you cultivate early on and that can remain for you all through your life. Be punctual. Punctual to class, punctual for submitting your assignments, fulfilling deadlines, and ensuring that punctuality not only becomes a character quality and an attribute, it actually becomes your part of your DNA. Eight, pride. Develop a sense of pride in what you're doing. Because if you start liking and developing a sense of pride in what you're doing, you will make sure that you will excel in it. You will constantly do your best. You will bring out the best in it if you are proud of what you're doing. If you are cynical and are indifferent, the chances of you not achieving that perfection, let alone having passion, is going to be the case. So develop a sense of pride. The ninth is possibility, the question of imagination. You know, your generation is that way very fortunate. Your generation is that way fortunate because you have the possibility to imagine anything that you want to do. There are no limitations in the possibility. You are privileged to be able to pursue higher education at an institution, which has actually begun classes when most of higher education institutions, not just in India, but around the world are struggling. 
Many of them have not even completed their examinations for the last academic year. Many of them are still not had entrance examinations for the new academic year, let alone having a schedule of starting of the new academic year. Each one of you students of Jindal School of Journalism and Communication are truly privileged that you have joined a university which has begun its academic session. Classes are being held and you are part of that. Now that you have got that privilege, there is enormous possibility and potential for you to fulfill your dreams and aspirations. And the 10th P is understand your power, the P of power. You know, all of us have enormous powers and I'm not talking about power with authority, the indomitable power that comes with our own imagination. And with all the other things that I mentioned, your power is going to be derived out of education, knowledge, skills, and perspectives. All the things that I talked about before is going to be part of your own power. Exercise your power to make a difference. The transformative education that you are going to receive at Jindal School of Journalism and Communication is going to help you build that power to seek truth, to remove injustice, to fight against discrimination, to strengthen democratic institutions, to address inequalities, to be able to fight against all forms of injustices and to be able to speak truth to power. With those words, I would like to once again congratulate each one of you for having received admission to the Jindal School of Journalism and Communication. I cannot wait to receive you on campus. I look forward to seeing you sooner than later. In the meantime, work has to go on. So please attend your classes and make the best use of this opportunity. I also want to take this opportunity to thank our registrar, Professor Sridhar Patayak, for his presence on this commencement lecture. And lastly, to deeply appreciate the presence of Dr. Minal Pandey for this commencement lecture, as it means a lot to us and indeed to the faculty and the students of Jindal School of Journalism and Communication. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, our Vice Chancellor, Professor Siraj Kumar there uh, with his 10 Ps to keep in mind as you go through the next three years at the Jindal Global University and beyond. And now it is my absolute pleasure and honor to introduce our speaker today, Ms. Rinal Pandey. Um, Ms. I mean, I, I, I did earlier say she needs no introduction, but let me just try and introduce her. Uh, Ms. Rinal Pandey is a person who has straddled several worlds. She is as acute a journalist as she is a commentator. She is as, uh, as fluent in English as she is in Hindi. She has been in print, she has been in television. She has basically, if you look at the last 30 years of journalism, you will see Nanal Pandey's presence in that space. Um, she's also an acclaimed author. She's been the chairperson of Prasad Bharti. She has been uh, honored with the Padma Shri for her work. And today she's honoring us with her presence. With, without further ado, I hand it over for our fourth commencement lecture to Nanal Pandey. Thank you, Sajuri. Uh, thank you and thank you, Mr. Vice Chancellor. Um, that was a very lavish introduction. I don't really know if I deserve it all. All I can say is that I've spent, truly spent a lifetime in journalism and seen many changes. So welcome to this profession. Like any profession worth joining, there will be plenty of people telling you it's not worth joining. Uh, it's not easy to break into. Initially, they'll tell you it has low pay, it has low visibility, long hours, minimum resources, and a lot of whining about how the industry is dying. Uh, I frankly do not believe in any of it. Uh, it's like a phoenix. It undergoes changes and it comes up again because so long as there are human beings, there will be a need to communicate. So long as there is a need to communicate and technology improves and makes it possible for people to communicate, not just one-sided, but on both sides, so much the better. So it's a very interesting profession that you are joining. In a way, like Dickens's <laughs> Tale of Two Cities, it's the best of times, it's the best of times, and it's certainly one of the most unusual of times. 
COVID is something that none of us had thought of. And therefore, um, it has, in a way, leveled the field in many ways. It has created a lot of uh, uh, problems. It has created a lot of fear, a lot of poverty. It has created some joblessness, even in the media. Uh, and yet, it has leveled the field in a way uh, which would have otherwise taken years. The new technology, for example, the technology that we are using and I'm using to address you has uh, been around for a long time. I remember very well in the early 90s, I had to wage a literal war against the journalists union at the Hindustan <laughs> Times to allow us to start using computers. Their uh, fear was that a lot of page makers and pasters and a lot of proofreaders would be laid off, which was true. But then with a little bit of retraining, they could be re-employed and they were re-employed. This is a time like that when currently we are morphing into a kind of a loose web of digital outfits in India. Um, mostly serviced by freelancers, young, underpaid, and keyboard technicians. On them, you, you will have an edge because you will have been trained properly. You will not have joined just because it is there, but you will have joined after having thought long and hard about it. And you will have been trained, I'm sure, by excellent teachers because two things I find missing in this a uh, hurried assemblage of the new media is, one is lack of old style newsrooms, which really trained us on the job as young journalists. And then we were able to mentor a lot of people, young people. And on the ground, it came in handy because people who had been there before you had already prepared you somewhat for what, it, what was going to happen. The second is mentoring by the older generation. We are all dinosaurs, I know, and somewhat technologically challenged compared to you. But I would still say that as long as you have that childlike curiosity within you, you can use it to mentor people. And that kind of mentoring, if you seek, there is nothing to be embarrassed about. It doesn't belittle you, and it does not aggrandize the power of the older generation. I think it's very essential for journalism at a point like this to keep the interaction between generations and genders alive. I've been noticing with some alarm that the number of female journalists who have been laid off is somewhat larger than the number of male journalists. It happens every time there is a laying off process on in the country. The first jobs that are gone are jobs which were being held by women. Uh, when I was researching women in the unorganized sector, I found that the unorganized sector was largely being handled by women. Then came layoffs uh, in the 21st century and more skilled people, but it, it took over the jobs in the formal sector. And all the men who were dislodged then came into the unorganized sector and took the jobs that the women were handling because A, they were men, B, they did not have uh, family pressures, and C, simply because the employers were more used to employing men. And I think you will keep these things in mind as you navigate your profession, both as men and women. Three things are extremely important now, and they have become even more important for your generation. The first thing is that what COVID has brought forth is the important importance of India's vernaculars. India's vernacular press has always been servicing more than 90% of the consumers. Likewise, the television and the social media. The biggest consumers of uh, Facebook and Twitter feeds are uh, uh, using vernaculars and they have likewise created facilities for them to be able to communicate, even in the remotest villages in the Hindi belt, for example, to Facebook. Are you on Facebook? It's a very common question. I'm sure down south, it's the same thing also. So it has really created an interconnection between Indian languages. And as journalists, it would be very important for you to capitalize on those. 
I by no means support Hindi as a national language. No, I don't think that we are ready for it. And non-Hindi speaking states have a perfect right to hold forth in their own native languages as well. So I think it helps a great deal to learn more languages. Um, I was born speaking a dialect Kumauni. I learned Hindi in school later, English in college. Then I taught myself several dialects that are spoken in the Hindi belt, which helped me as a journalist. The dialects spoken in the Western part of India are very different from the dialects spoken in the Eastern part. And since Hindi we use in journalism is a kind of a salad bowl, unless you know the dialects of your area, you cannot really service your clients uh, perfectly in a language which they will easily understand and which they will warm up to. This comes across very strongly in the visual media. When you are reporting uh, on television or making a video, uh, it's very essential that you, are, you look and you sound familiar in the language in which you are speaking. So please reserve a special space in your mind for vernaculars, your own native language, plus as many vernaculars as you can pick up, because they will help you report from every part of the country. Uh, second point is that we are now a multi-dimensional uh, media. Anybody who works in the media will now be working in the digital media. So um, you are coming of age in the age of web, when newsroom support and mentoring of old style is not available, but at the same time, there are a lot of sources of news feeding into your catchment areas, which you will need to judge very, very prudently and swiftly. Um, one finds that a lot of news that is flowing in has dubious sources, is under-researched, is unverified, uh, likewise for videos. And of course, there is fake news, which is deliberately floated. There is a whole army of trolls let loose by various political parties. All those will be feeding into the area where you are sifting news. So your own news gathering will have to be also interlaced with some of these stories. You have to be very, very careful how you, uh, there are now fortunately sites which uh, check out on all, some of what uh, seem like fa uh, fake news items, and then they advise you on it, which is fake and which is not. And as your vice chancellor also advised you, patience is the virtue here. I know it's a very fast moving media now, much faster than uh, it was in our time. Your readers and your viewers are also mobile, uh, which ours were not. Ours was an audience which was bound to a desk or sitting at home and reading the paper from page to page. Today's audiences can read any newspaper anywhere on their smartphone, uh, on their smartphone surfaces. Even in the villages, a lot of people, a lot of students are learning through the smartphone. So you have to tailor your news likewise. Attention spans have become narrower. People want smaller news items, but well researched. And they like you to give them that, to tailor it. So your style becomes a very, very major decider of how popular or successful you are going to be, either as a broadcaster or as a print journalist. Uh, having said that, uh, I have noticed one very interesting fact, which should interest you also, that traditionally we have been a Vajik or an oral society. Everything was recorded orally, even the Vedas were transmitted orally. All our folk tales were transmitted orally. Even the long stories which were set into poems were transmitted orally. And then print intervened. Print intervened at a very interesting point. Uh, just after the a feeling of unease with colonial rule began in India. For a long time, Indians popped off the print medium. 
The Portuguese brought it into India. The British set up the first printing presses. They set up the first newsprint making businesses in Kolkata. But amazingly, there was a lot of resistance. People preferred either the oral media or they preferred handwritten books, uh, which only the very rich could afford. And of course, illiteracy was endemic, so nobody really minded. But literacy has risen now. And interestingly, again, uh, the first newspapers were brought out not by the public, as it happened in medieval, uh, in uh, middle uh, Europe. Uh, they were brought out by the feudals, the small feudals who ruled principalities and the British, of course. The British had their own government uh, presses, which they needed to communicate, like much like the government today. But the feudals brought out these little presses in their native languages. You would be interested to know that exactly a hundred years ago, in 1920 to be precise, the first Indian newspaper was banned and censored completely. It was a paper called Rajasthan Kesari, which was banned by the state of Udaipur, the princely state of Udaipur, because it had some nasty things to say about the rulers, ruling family of Udaipur. So uh, we are moving cyclically back to the spoken word. Uh, and I find that spoken word and written word are now going to supplement each other in India for a long time. And maybe most people instinctively opt for the spoken word, even though our current news TV channels have not really endeared themselves by displaying the kind of news that they have. But anyway, it's a cycle that we are moving through. We started with the Vajik or the oral tradition. We moved to print. Print created a public sphere. The public sphere was peopled by slowly by more and more people who spoke in vernaculars. They created a commercial sphere. Then the commercial companies came in and started the big advertising drive. By the end of the 20th century, there was an obscene amount of profits being made by print newspapers, but came the 21st century and things began to change. The visual media became more interesting, the digitized space grew, digital platforms came up, and now with the intercom and the net, net becoming such an important part of everybody's life from rural to urban India, and also the markets. This is a space your generation is, is going to see interesting things happening in. And I feel very excited for you. And I would love to monitor it very closely uh, just from the outside, which is a nice way of being because you've done your work and now you can uh, laugh at other people's foolishness or praise their uh, interesting, innovative ways. Uh, so um, having said that, there are challenges. The first challenge is that the media today is infinitely less free all the world over than it was, say, a decade earlier. Uh, we ourselves in India, the World Press Freedom Index now rates us two notches below um, what we were in 2018. The last report, 2019, rates us at the 140th place among 180 nations in the world, which is not really a very grand place to be. The other thing is that uh, there is very little neutral space available today. Uh, as I said, the commercial companies exploited the public space and then the commercial companies have since been getting closer and closer and politically more partisan. So large mega companies are growing up everywhere in the world and everything is now being in a way um, affected and decided that the public say in the matter of choosing the news or the kind of information it needs is getting less. You have to expand that. Uh, I don't know how you will do it. I'm sure you will do it. I've seen such immense flowering of young minds in my last 10 years. Uh, I'm quite confident that you'll be able to do that. Second, there is a push towards the regionalization, which is good because in the 19th, the push was away from regionalization. Mega papers took over and brought out 
150 editions in Hindi were the most successive, successful paper. Uh, Dainik Jagran today boasts to be the world's largest circulating paper. It has over 50 editions. Now, uh, those editions, in a way, mopped up all the local advertising and the local readers, with the result, the thinner and less artistically produced local papers died up. But with the rise in regionalism and the rise in oral communication, I think there will be a greater push for regional journalism. And that is why I come again and again to the question of vernaculars, to the question of inclusion of women, because gender issues for your generations are going to be supremely important. Then the, there is the issue of ownership. Who owns the media? Uh, when I started, it was easy enough to know who owned the big houses. Usually these were big families which had other business interests and they also had a newspaper. Then there were many families which started a newspaper like Dani Jagran itself started in a small town in Kanpur. Amar Ujala started in a small town in Agra. And these became very successful because they were regionally connected with their audiences and then they brought out other, uh, they bought up some smaller regional papers and started expanding. But that ownership then transformed as the profits grew into corporate ownership. The first sign was that the editors became owner editors by equity in the firm which they edited, which I didn't think it was a good idea at all. Anyway, so slowly the corporatization shifted the focus of the media away from the consumers to the annual profits, the EBDTA uh, lines, as we said. And that made that began to change. And that is when paid news came in. And paid news made its way. People were actually paying new to be uh, adjusted. There was a big backlash against it. So they became more subtle. And so kind of uh, corporate understandings were held between the owners and the advertisers. Now the advertising mega pie has shifted to the digital media and to online media. With the result, big platforms like, the, like Google, like Facebook, uh, like Microsoft are really the mega bucks earners. Whereas the advertising pie for newspapers is shrinking. You must have seen how our papers are becoming thinner and thinner, um, how they're losing uh, you know, those city pullouts, how many of them have closed shop. A lot of magazines have closed down in various vernaculars. So the ownership uh, issue is very important because owners now have very, very obvious political ideological connections with various parties. And uh, very often what they get done in their media products is not what the readers or the viewers want, but what the particular political party which patronizes them and funds them wants. So that is something for you to watch out for. And then, of course, uh, there are the perennial problems with the law. Uh, we are made to <laughs> be legally challenged because speaking truth with power is not very easy. I still remember way back in 1989, when my, the first case was filed against me, um, I went to the manager and he patted my back and he said, now you have come of age, unless an editor has a case filed against him or her, we don't consider them mature enough. And of course we fought it back. But uh, two things I find worrisome. One is the increasing use of criminal uh, law against journalists. Defamation law was usually a civil, uh, used in the civil form. If you make it criminal, then that means that the journalist has to get a bail. And then the very often they are filed in several courts, which makes it very difficult for a working journalist to be present in various courts and to travel so much. So that is something worrisome. The other thing, of course, is the contempt, contempt of court. We have just, we've all been through this uh, big public spectacle in which a lawyer challenged the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court held him guilty of contempt, fined him one rupee, which he paid up. But the matter has not closed. And contempt laws are something that you need to 
be watching out for. Having said that, I think it is still a profession worth being associated with. It is sim singly the most exciting, excitable place to be in. Uh, I am a votary of patience, but I can confess to frequently being impatient. I am a votary of um, uh, being very, very particular about uh, my news sources. But sometimes when news is important and it can be verified, then sources can go to hell. But you must have provable sources. You must have provable proofs and that makes it uh, necessary. Um, so in the end, I would like to round off by reminding you that if you study the history of pandemics, including the present day pandemic, you find that during the pandemic, which really kills off a lot of people, sweeps the countries clean of a lot of beliefs and old institutions and so on, um, India is also going through a kind of a mental catharsis. Uh, mental catharsis in its democracy, mental catharsis in its institutions of teaching, of, in its institutions of journalism. Um, uh, Bukashi wrote his uh, wonderful Decameron, which is a collection of tales told by 10 people who had run off from, uh, from the city uh, to escape the plague. And they were, uh, they were done with God. They were done with priests. They were done with philosophy. They thought this was the end of life. So let's make merry and say the unsayable. So I think this is also what is going to happen because the field is becoming clearer. The media is becoming more technically savvy. And there are good young minds rearing to start working and being trained. So I think there's going to be a great deal of innovation a great deal of flowering of minds and re-democratization re of the media space. And as for governmental interference, I will not say too much. Um, you know, when uh, the great philosopher uh, was dying, uh, the priest was called and the priest said, my son, please curse the devil. And he said, Father, this is no time to make fresh enemies. So I shall not make fresh enemies for you or me. But uh, good luck to you. I hope you enjoy this profession. I did enjoy it. Try to be multilingual. Try to learn as many languages as you can. Be gender, gender neutral. And welcome women into the space. They are natural carriers, gatherers and put downers of news. So the more women in the profession, the better and more humane the reporting becomes. Thank you all very much. I wish you all the very best. And I thank the Jindal School for inviting me to be able to speak to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Pandey, for those, uh, for those words. And I think uh, just a really great both uh, historical and current perspective of where we stand today uh, with the profession and with sort of the sort of larger new developing spaces in general. Uh, for anybody who has questions, please leave them in the live chat and I will convey them to Ms. Pandey. Uh, but first, I, uh, I have a question that I wanted to ask. Uh, Ms. Pandey, do you feel that there has been an erosion of trust when it comes from the public towards the news media in the last decade and a half or so? And if so, where do you situate it and how do you see that fixing itself? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the first half of your question. Uh, do you see the, an erosion of trust which has taken place right. by the public towards the news media as it stands today? And if you do, how do you see that sort of reform itself? So that is the challenge in the, the period that we are faced with, because we are not really able to interact freely as a society in public spaces. And therefore we rely more and more on news that we receive from various media. There is so much fake news and there is so much fake videos happening that it's become very difficult and there is a certain erosion of trust. You're quite right. But I think the media needs to pull up its socks, particularly the TV news channels. Today, ratings-wise, the Republic TV enjoys the primacy in the field. And uh, sober TV like, say, Rabish, 
where Ravish Kumar um, stands at the NDTV is at the ninth rank. So I think people have to also become more mature. As a country at the moment, we are like a little child in a candy store. We are seeing all this colorful language and all this gali galoj and all this fisticuffs happening and we get attracted, but we forget that as members of a democracy, there is endemic poverty, joblessness is happening. I feel as the fog lifts and people feel the regression next to their own skins, they would want to go to news as it used to be, as they expect it to be. And that's where professional newsrooms, professional news channels, professional news media becomes very important. Uh, you've... Uh... You've been, if so as to speak, on the other side of the fence in your capacity as uh, the chairperson of Prasar Bharti. Uh, when it comes to that particular kind of role versus your role as an editor or a journalist, what do you see as the balancing act of that kind of space? Uh, Prasar Bharti, actually, I was uh, uh, the chairing the board and we took policy decisions regarding the uh, Prasar Bharti. But I found that in the, it had immense potential, but a government media will always be a government media. And given the nature of politics, every government in power will try to make it its mouthpiece. So having said that, I don't think that we can expect government media, Doordarshan or All India Radio to compete with commercial or private channels or and thank god we have private uh, choices also but um, when people want information about government's policies or want to understand what the government is currently thinking on a particular point then that media becomes very necessary having said that i think it has been very badly run and now i hear that they're going to get their first appointments board in place after over 30 years and so once their own staff is selected, the staff will then stay because at the moment, uh, the old staff is all superannuated. Some of them have been given some extensions, but most of them are gone. With that, the institutional memory is gone. So, and then they have a vast library from 1921 onwards of Im immensely important recordings for the AIR which are all in another format, which need to be digitized soon because they will otherwise become obsolete. So I think it has its task cut out for it, but we must not expect too much from it right now, except unless we want to understand what the government is doing or saying or thinking. We have a couple of questions which have come in. Our student Shardul Srinath has a question saying, this transition from traditional newsrooms to a more integrated digital setup can have its drawbacks. Uh, how could we address these concerns and improve the efficiency of today's newsrooms? Sorry, the second half was not. Uh, how could can we address? You can look into your mic and speak. Uh -huh. So, that, that will okay. be more. so uh, essentially, this transition from traditional newsrooms to a more integrated digital setup can have its drawbacks. How could we address these concerns and improve the efficiency of today's newsrooms? I think. Uh, by and by we'll discover how to do that because one went through this in the print media also particularly in the hindi media in the up to the 1940s major houses like times of india and the hindustan times had hindi products but they were usually filled with translations from the english newspaper they didn't have their own newsrooms so around 1960s the newsrooms began to be created for vernacular papers and then they, it was a hit and miss and a trial method. And then gradually, they also dissociated themselves from the English product, which helped them grow and create their own kind of newsrooms. So I think this is what will happen in the digital space also. Each channel or each portal will assess its needs and the best. And then likewise with that and with the new technology, create a virtual newsrooms. Uh, there's a question from my colleague, uh, Richard Asen. Uh, she asks, uh, have class relations in ownership patterns of media changed? Are there opportunities to move towards a more equitable ownership? 
uh, class relations unfortunately have not changed but when i pointed out how the feudals were the first to launch the newspapers the trend continued except that most of the feudals were replaced by um, corporates uh, so there is a feudal attitude uh, that continues especially vis-a-vis -vis indian languages and women and also dalits there are very few dalits and uh, obcs in newsrooms anywhere um, one took care to recruit people from the dalit and obc groups uh, fortunately with 30 odd years of obc reservation one can get excellent people uh, from the obcs but dalits as a group and also aboriginals the adivasis as a group are still full of hesitations they have linguistic handicaps because they mostly come from small towns have not been trained very well and i think we have to pay a special attention to this just as in schools we have special classes for challenged kids we should have special classes for dalits for women from small towns from tribals and other members who are very very valuable sources of news about parts of country which very few political leaders have really traversed after gandhi you talked about the law um and the way the law is often weaponized against journalists uh there have been um i mean i remember this the conversation taking place when i joined the the, the profession in 2005 and i know from what i had heard that the conversation had been taking place for 30 years before that the idea of uh of an equivalent if you will essentially the idea of a more empowered press council uh do you feel that that balance is something that india has failed to negotiate uh i think india needs to regain its balance there were there are still are institutions that were built press council for its example is one such institution the editors guild was another independent organization that came up but of late they have been too late or lackluster in reacting also the press council in as much as it has among its members newspaper owners also is often reluctant for example the report on paid media there was a wonderful report on paid media which they had commissioned but when it came then a lot of owners and members uh, commented on that and then it was kind of shrunk overnight and reduced to a very small form so that kind of a thing has been happening uh, again on kashmir on various other prickly issues like the prashant bhushan case the media has been the media bodies have been extremely guarded uh, so i think the institutions that were created to protect and help the media have really to take a deep breath and then the media has to kick them on the back side and tell them what the hell you behave otherwise you are no use to us a uh, question from my colleague um, uh, annie zeri print was inclusive of fiction poetry essays this made for a more reflective media scape with more literate people reading less is it possible to make room for reflection via news platforms it is because i find that the need for reflection comes with age when you are young you are in a hurry you are committed you are if you are a woman you are multitasking even many men now are multitasking and therefore the time for reflection shrank fortunately during the covid this lockdown has helped a lot of people regain their marbles and a lot of uh, i noticed that a lot of blogs and a lot of uh, uh, sites in hindi have started giving place even twitter gives links to poems and poets and so i think by and by as people need as they say in music chain they need to be able to occasionally sit back and reflect upon life and arts and the crafts and the linkages between the two i think that will happen it may take some time while the technology settles all around us but i think most people during the past 6 months that i have talked to have realized that they were rushing around charging around too much spending too little time to expand their minds a question from our student tushar verma what can possibly change the broadcast news media 
like you said, the public should be mature, but how can we expect such a huge population to act maturely when a majority of them are glued to noisy channels? I think they're addicted to noisy channels because for the same reason that people like Dijum Dijum films, but that doesn't mean that good films will stop being made. And as the audiences mature, as the democracy matures, people do exercise mature choices. And I think uh, people will gradually find a balance. If you read our folk literature, you find it was crafted by very mature minds. Uh, it was frivolous, it was humorous, it had a sense of humor, it had a sense of irreverence, and yet it was a very, very gripping media. And I think the media owes it to the audiences to be irreverent and speak truth to power without sounding boring. You know, what is the biggest sin in the media is being boring. I myself abhor bores. Uh, you know, uh, I avoid all these uh, <laughs> web seminars, webinars and everything, primarily because I find them very boring. So I think if media can model itself into becoming interesting, uh, into becoming relevant to the lives of the people. Because the mainstream media is not sounding relevant to people. You know, they that is why they are watching out for Sushant Rajput and Rhea, because the real life for them, either you give them day-to-day -day news about what is happening to people who are out of jobs in various classes, communities, genders, classes, and you give them hard-hitting small news pieces, they will read it. But we are blocking that. We are not really giving what they require in an interesting format. So interesting is the operative word. You have to hold their attention. Uh, we have a question here from Puneet Gupta, student of ours, who asks, um, as somebody who's been involved with Prasar Bharti, do you feel that broadcast news is sufficient to sustain democracy in India, considering that even today, private radios cannot collect and broadcast their own news? I think um, Prasar Bharti was handicapped for a long time because it did not have its own staff. It launched the first FM Gold channel and had a big following. It nursed it for 17 years and had a big following. But they did not even have a fallback machine, I realized. So if ever the communication broke down, then they were not able to have a fallback machine at their disposal. Moreover, it was being run by 100% underpaid, underutilized staff, which had been brought in on contracts. These contracts were terminated before the year was over, so they were not able to unionize. The recruitment was being done perfunctorily here, there, and everywhere. So, you know, everybody tried to push and jostle for a spot uh, in this. So they were no match. I mean, they had excellent, uh, they have such an excellent library of everything, music, speeches, what have you. And they were not able to use that because the ministry sat over it. So there was a great push and pull between the autonomous board and the ministry itself. It still continues in most public sector units, not just Prasar Bharti. Every public sector unit put up by the government, there is an independent so-called autonomous board, but the ministry wants to reign supreme and the ministry wants to have the last say, control the purse strings, control the staff. And now that Prasar Bharti is going to be recruiting its own staff, I hope in another couple of years, we'll see some more life in it. Uh, I know that uh, you didn't talk about the government, but it feels like the question and answer session might want to take that up again. We've got a question from Trey Kurana who's asking, there's been a certain amount of hostility shown by the government towards journalists in some cases. Have you ever experienced something similar? And what is your take on the issue of sedition laws? Well, there is an old Hindi saying, Ghoda ghas se dosti karega to khayega kya? If a horse befriends grass, what is it going to live on? So there is a certain amount of hostility. Um, you know, in the early um, 2000, there was a supposedly a blacklist uh, for Durdarshan. I was on it. 
and then uh, because somebody took a dislike to me and then one day i was approached and said that would i come for a program i said but i am told that i've been blacklisted so please check it up so the poor guy checked it up and said i'm sorry i'm sorry i withdraw so there was a fabled blacklist and there still i'm sure uh, is some kind of official or unofficial uh, blacklist so i think you just have to be so good that people really will seek you out and listen to you but you do not compromise with that kind of a thing by kowtowing to the past that we and i think that the government also needs occasionally people who are rated well by the people by the public as such um, you know they if they want really serious news they still go to doordarshan or they go to ravish kumar or they even go to rajdeep sardesai they certainly do not go to republic to republic they go to you know like chavanni glass people throwing mumphali skins and uh, chavannis uh, to, <laughs> to, towards the screen so i think the tension will always be there but the media has to really um, do the balancing we need them we need the government because there are biggest sources of uh, news you know what they decide decides the life for bulk of our country because the bulk of the country cannot afford Uh, to have uh, free um, services the rich can keep their own guards they can have their own pumping um, uh, water stations they can have their own electrical standbys and the machines but the poor are dependent on the state for everything even their children's education many of them even for the manrega jobs so their lives really hinge on the governments and it's the duty of the media to focus on that area if the government is doing a good job of course re- report it but if the government is doing a shoddy job then gather and that is why we all fought for rti because within rti you can find out straight from the horse's mouth what it has done what it has not done and what it is not capable of doing um the traditional sort of academic approach the one that which we were all taught when we started uh, working as journalists was that journalists have to at all costs be neutral and objective uh today with social media there is a clear impression that there needs to be some form of opinion that also is shared and now we see that opinion also shifting on to the screens and on to the page uh, do you feel that this shift from sort of neutrality to commentary on the part of journalists is a dangerous one uh, i think it's also connected somewhere with a kind of mental laziness you can be interesting without really you know uh, bearing yourself and daring others uh, i remember the late kishori amonkar the musician i was talking to her once and i talked about a young entrepreneur who was singing pop songs and uh, you know setting all kinds of music into the uh, rag dari tradition so i asked her i said what do you think of her she has a great following on uh, social media and she said dekho aisa hai if you wear a sari and sit down and sing only the cognizant and those who want to really enjoy music will come but if you wear a skirt and pick up a guitar and dance you will of course gather a bigger crowd but do you want that crowd uh, so i think the question answers itself the media has to balance uh, uh, between entertainment and uh, seriousness sobriety because people at the end of the day also to now realize how much their lives depend on good verified and verifiable news from impeccable sources so i think the media has to hold its fort and not give in or compromise and not be lazy i'm very glad that your uh, vice chancellor harped again and again on being punctual <laughs> on not being mentally lazy or lethargic i think right from the beginning if the students are not too casual or dismissive or cynical about these things it helps it helps a great deal of course they must have fun they are young they should have fun also but that doesn't mean when it comes to profession then you have to sober up in a hurry so um thank you so much uh ms pande for speaking to our students yes. today and giving us such a remarkable overview i have one last question before you go uh, which is to go back to the point that you have made about the about vernacular journalism what we find today is 
almost a class identity which is being constructed by the kind of journalism you choose to access. Uh, less so possibly on television, even more so on uh, various other networks. If we look at social media spaces, the banning of TikTok, which took place um, of course, on the grounds of, of it being funded by China, but uh, the banning of TikTok was also a huge silencing of a vernacular voice. Is the vernacular voice today more seen as more dangerous to certain Is the powers? Vernacular voice, sorry? Seen, seen as being more dangerous to certain powers? Um, yes and no. I think the more sober and the more sensible part of the vernacular voice is very important because it's the sole source of communication with the masses. Uh, you cannot deny that. The need is for the vernacular voices also to spruce up and get their act together. Uh, TikTok was a wonderful example. I quite enjoyed watching it and people my age and my colleagues were quite amazed at that. And I said, I like the bounce and the liveliness of the thing which is what is lacking in mainstream news, which is why people are migrating to Republic TV and the likes of it. If we can bring that kind of earthiness, we can bring that kind of bounce into uh, news, um, then we can really spruce up our act enough for people who do not speak that particular vernacular or whose mother tongue it is not to come and see it. Why do people go to see Hindi films? People from all parts of India, not only from all parts of India, even in Central Asian countries, even in Russia, good, even in China. <laughs> Dangal was a big hit in China. So they all watch films, but they also were sophisticated films. Raj Kapoor's films or Dangal were pretty sophisticated. They were popular, but they were pretty sophisticated technology-wise storyline wise and that is what uh, the vernacular media needs to do um, and also of course the advertising world also has to loosen its ties and realize that old school ties do not work in the media space anymore you have the largest clients uh, clamoring from the largest biggest markets in the vernacular spoken areas so you have to really um, you know get off your high horses be a little less squeamish and class conscious about interacting it applies to women also you know there are you you will notice that the same attitudes prevailed about women uh, 30 years ago and gradually as the media realized the invaluable contribution of women and women became adept at rolling with the punches um, they grew and media was the better for it Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Pandey. Uh, thank you, Dean Goldstein. Uh, to the, thank you to the Vice Chancellor. Thank you to our Registrar. And of course, thank you to the IT crew for putting this together. We can't, we just wouldn't be here without them. Thank you to all our students for joining us and for asking some incredible, incisive questions. And finally, once again, a huge welcome to the batch of 2020. May you have a wonderful experience here. Take what Ms. Pandey has said to heart. There are so many lessons to be learned. We'll be building on a lot of the themes that she has put forward over the three years that you spend in school. Thank you once again. It was an absolute delight, Ms. Pandey, to have you. Thank you, Kajuri. Thank you, everyone. And welcome once more, students. Thank you.